I just started recording. Okay, I think it, when he joins, it should automatically put his face up there. In That's the, right. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, so. we'll, we'll get us where.
Hello. Hello. Hello, Miguel. Hey. Hey, everybody. Uh, is that my face on the big screen back there? <laughs> <laughs> Great to see everyone. Uh, so, um, why don't we go and have everybody introduce themselves, and then I will say about 45 seconds worth of introduction, and then uh, it'll be your show. Does that make sense? Great. That sounds good. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm just want I just want to make sure that the sound is is okay. Can can someone play a few notes? Because I'm getting a little bit of um, distortion. I want to make sure because it's raining that it might we might have uh, some uh, distortion here. So maybe just play a few notes for me. Yeah, I, th I think it's gonna work. If if it cuts out a little bit, it's fine. I'll just we'll just repeat something. But I think it's working fine now. Sounds great. Okay. Yeah. Great. So feel free to come in anytime. Uh, so I just wanted to say hello to our audience. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we are so thrilled to be playing this piece for our uh, our uh, visiting artists. Chavez is regarded as the most uh, prominent, serious composer in Mexico, um, and he rubbed elbows with Aaron Copland and Leonard Bernstein and Igor Stravinsky. He was also eminent in building the Mexican classical music scene throughout the 20th century. And one of the things he did was to explore Mexican street music and folk tunes. And when we play this interesting thing, you will hear lots of Stravinsky. I'm hearing a lot of Stravinsky's Least Guarda Soldat, but you'll also hear all kinds of rather sassy Mexican street music. So would you like us to start at the beginning and play through and- uh, Please, yeah. Yeah, place play through everything. Yeah. Thank you. 
Wonderful playing, and it sounds like you all have been playing this for a long time together because a lot of it was so together and so really tight, and I and I know there's some tricky rhythms and everything. So bravo to bravo to you. It sounds sounds wonderful. Um, so just just to get right right back, let's just go right back to the beginning, and we can just start working and uh, see see what we can discover. So right away, there it's really interesting looking at the score because as you know, you probably know, there are a lot of differences in, in the dynamics for each instrument, each instrument, which is very interesting and peculiar. So for instance, we start off with the clarinet at mezzo forte, and then we have the oboe and, and bassoon at mezzo piano. So right there, there are some um, different levels of dynamics that I think we should maybe exaggerate a little bit more. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, and um, that'll help the overall character too. I think you're doing a really good job of kind of bringing out some of these accents and rhythms and staccatos, but I think those can be also just exaggerated just a little bit more to kind of clear clear the air, clear the character, so it comes through exactly as the composer, what we imagine exactly as the composer would have liked. Um, so you're already doing a lot of that. I just want to make it um, even clearer because, you know, I'm staring at the score here, but sometimes we have to exaggerate the uh, different stratas of, of dynamics and voices in order to make it a little bit clearer for the, for the listener, for the audience, uh, without knowing the piece and hearing it for the first time. So um, I want you to think about that as we go back um, to the opening and see how much of that stuff we can exaggerate and then I'll, I'll jump in and uh, comment when we can uh, try to do something a little bit a little bit better. Great, great. This is great. Um, so there's something right in the beginning. Um, bravo, everyone sounds great. The clarinet. Um, can you can that uh, triplet in the second uh, beat of the second measure come a little bit sooner? I feel like it's a, it might be a, a hair late um, off of that tie. We just have to watch out for those ties. There's a lot of that in this piece. Um, so we get off the tie a little bit sooner. Uh, great. Let's just try that again. I I think, for a balance sake, maybe a little a little louder in the clarinet would be would be great, if if possible. Just I know it's mezzo forte, but just a tiny bit from from here from the over the speakers, um, you can kind of since you start off the piece too, you can kind of start off with a little bit more confidence. Okay. Thanks. Let's just go from the beginning again. Yeah, um, very close, very close. 
what I want to do is really quickly just take this a little slower. So we see, especially let's pay attention to um, the third bar, that that bar kind of starts together and the one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, the fifth and the sixth bar. I feel like the sixth bar doesn't exactly, puppy, puppy, that this doesn't really line up exactly as tight as we would like it to. Let's just do a little bit under, just a little bit under, just to check it. Ah, yeah, so I heard something. I think I know what happens. Um, that wasn't too much slower, but I was able to hear exactly what was going on. In the fourth bar, one, two, three, four, um, beat um, bump, beat bump, beat. Try not to rush this um, bar in the clarinet because um, you're, all, you're all alone and it's really helpful just to keep that steady in that bar. And I think that'll help lock everything in. Okay, let's, let's just start it once again, one last time from the beginning and then we'll continue. Yeah, full tempo. Yeah, this is nice. This is um, really good. I think there's something else. When you have the these um, accents, when we have this kind of um, jazzy or, uh, or something style syncopated rhythm where we have the accents on some of these offbeats, especially the repeated ones, we need to bring those out just a little bit more whenever anybody has those, the, the accents that come later, not the early accents, but the ones later, like the third, the fourth, or fifth accent that you have, those need to come out a little bit more in order for us to kind of feel that rhythm kind of um, uh, kind of expand. And, and it's kind of think about it as an embellishment that keeps getting greater and greater and more exciting. Um, it, it, it's the first accents we always hit. It's the later ones that we have a hard time hearing and a hard time kind of feeling. So that'll really make it a lot more fun for the listener. Can we uh, try, um, yes, yeah, just go from one, please. Yeah, this yeah, this is great. I'm starting to really feel that um, that excitement in the rhythm, and it's really helpful to be able to kind of have that feel that we can dance to it. You almost want to get up and start dancing to it when you can really hear those clearly. Uh, now, when the oboe takes over this, it's interesting. He writes, "This is the the fortissimo. Maybe this is the, um, in fact, the first fortissimo we have in the whole piece." So I really want these sforzandi, um, these fortissimo sforzandos to be louder and crisper, um, especially from the bassoon. Um, bum, 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 bum. Uh, and from the oboe, if you can, just a little bit more sound if possible. Okay, uh, let's just try, try right there at five. Great, 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 great. Um, very close. The other thing is that on these um, syncopated accents, they, they really need to be on time, really not late at all on top of the beat. Bump, 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 bump. So anticipate, especially just like with the accents being less as we go along 
and we have to make those more, these also need to be more intense as they travel. And, and, and usually we get later, um, the later um, we go in a passage. So we tend to go bump, 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 you know, it drags a little bit as we continue in the phrase. So we really need to stay on top of the beat here. Uh, as, you know, rests are the, um, they make it very challenging to come in after rests. So imagine that you're playing what the oboe has. So you have those accents with them. Uh, so let's try five again. Okay, yeah, nice. Two tiny little things, details, details. This is really great playing. So usually we wanna kind of shy away from some of the high notes on the on the clarinet, but this one at fortissimo after seven, third of seven, I think you can bring out. It's ba -ba 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 you can scream that out a little bit more. And he only writes uh, diminuendo poco at the end of that. Uh, so can we try seven and, and try to bring that out a little bit? Um, and then we come back down to mezzo forte after. Yeah, one second. Yeah, uh, very good. Let's try it one more time. And we have pum, pum. Bum, 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 in the bassoon. Make sure you have enough air like ready to go to make that reed vibrate right away. Okay, let's try seven one more time. Nice. Now, now that we get to this um, moderato section, which is very interesting, has a really cool sound to it. Um, I I just want to see if we can just adjust the the pitch just a little bit. This was my the dynamics were the first thing on kind of my list of notes um, that I wrote down, and the second was the pitch, especially in this section here. Um, bam, bam, di, ha, di, ha. Could we keep this pitch a little bit lower because you're the bass in the bassoon? Um, that if we if we keep keep, keep the um, the E's especially seem to be sitting a little bit high compared to the to the trumpet. Um, so could we try this section and just kind of think and you know think a little bit lower in pitch and maybe I don't know if it helps to like kind of really sustain the sound a little bit more or blow it out, but you know just kind of use your Use your ear, you'll hear it, um, and, and just adjust as you're playing with the pitch. Can we start there, right at the um, moderato? Great. Yeah, that's better. That's better. Now, could we sing it out a little bit more? And as you do so, make sure you don't um, drag because we have this motor going. It's remember, it's always after this tied note 
that we have to play the next note just slightly early. So basically, what I like to do when I'm playing is, um, is and I never used to do this when I was younger as much as I really believe in it now. It's just a subdivision that helps with your phrasing. So what I would do if I were you to practice this is I would almost uh, like to practice it. So I would tongue the, the rhythm underneath my sustained line to practice this in the practice room. It's just a very healthy um, um, and helpful technique that I like to use for or orchestra playing or orc excerpts um, for chamber music, you name it, it really does work to get a sense of what a subdivision mean. And it, it can help your phrasing too, because you can kind of play the line with the dynamics that you need to make it more expressive too. It's just a really helpful tool that I like to use um, when I'm practicing. So uh, let's let's try this once again. Okay, yeah, everyone, this sounds great. Yeah, I would just check this, this, all of these um, uh, notes with the tuner as we as we practice in the room uh, later, because I just not sometimes when you're playing in a group, in a chamber group, you kind of don't know. It's like, well, you, you know, I you might be high, I might be low, I might. It doesn't really matter. Um, I just like to always just check, you know, when we're practicing, rehearsing, like, what does that feel like? Am I in the right place? Or maybe everyone else is totally out too. That always happens. I think we just need to be open about it and like very honest about it and comfortable with talking about that stuff. Um, and so I sometimes, for instance when I think I'm one way or one direction, I might have guessed wrong. I'm often the other <laughs> that I know. So I just like to like to check, you know, just go back to the to the room and see like, where where was I? And you know what, so what's surprising is maybe everyone else is out. So you have to then you go back to the group and say, you know, I checked this with the tuner. I'm like, I think we can do this or this with the tuner just so we get our intervals. And when we play uni unisons together, um, we can work those out. So we're in the same ballpark. Um, and so, you know, just everybody just check that when we go back to the drawing board. Uh, let's see. I would love to do 11 again. And I just want to make sure we're filling up with enough air and we're letting our reeds vibrate when we play. Sometimes I feel like we get um, kind of restricted with our sound and with our setups and with our mouthpieces or reeds. So, and the weather is so strange, it's changing, it's warm, it's cold, it's doing all this weird stuff. So let's see if we can get these, all these pieces of, of wood to just vibrate a little bit more and give it some resonance, okay, without kind of restriction, just kind of let it free. It sounds great, but I just want more resonance in the tone in this section and, and freedom. Um, so just feel comfortable to kind of sing out, okay? Great, just from 11. Maybe that's a bad spot, but let's try it. Yeah. Thank you. 
Great. You know, this is an interesting, challenging section here because it's kind of like gnarly and you can kind of feel all of these tensions and everything. So what I want is is for it and I and you know, forgive me if the dynamic that I'm asking for, the expression I'm, is, is coming across in the hall and I'm just, the speakers aren't loud enough here or whatever. But the feeling I want is kind of like that massive peak se section, um, section in like a um, big orchestral work where it's like all the brass and the winds are kind of like, um, have these big grand um, kind of cascading chords and sounds that kind of fill up the big hall. You know, so and the conductor is jumping all over the podium and it's like really grand. It's almost like you could imagine like something like, um, you know, uh, pictures at an exhibition or or some some grand thing like this that's very uh, it's picturesque and or like like maybe firebird or something like that you know at the end of, of firebird but like big sounds big accents lots of character lots of air blowing through the instrument to get that intensity going because if it's kind of sounds like it's almost there it doesn't have the uh the real impact and it just sounds a little bit dissonant and kind of uh, gnarly i guess if you clashing but sometimes if you really just go for it all the way with the character, then it really um, impacts the listener uh, much more. So I think you know what I, exactly what I'm talking about. So just really go for it and see if, if that feels much better to play as well. Uh, from 13, perhaps? Yeah, that whole section was really intense and I, I, I really liked it. I think all of those things that uh, um, the eighth, the second half of the eighth beats of the main beats that come together, you can work um, in the practice room rehearsal on getting those um, exactly together to make it even more powerful, say from 14, for instance, and we can try that really quickly. But um, one request is that at uh, one after 15, we, if you can, um, give room to, to the bassoon, more room. So this really, after 15, da 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 And she keeps saying, da 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 I think if it's possible, I don't want to get too involved in kind of technical things about the instrument. Um, it sounds great, but I would love it if you would spin the sound a little bit more in the bassoon. It sounds great but I feel like sometimes the sound could be moving a little bit more to get that expression. And even when you can't play it like louder, sometimes what you need is to play more expressive, you know, to get that, that character out. So I don't know if it's just spinning a little, with a little bit more spin of vibrato in the tone or something to like add all these things um, when you have the solo to get, make sure the listener is really attracted to what you're doing and you kind of, show off a little bit more okay because it, it sounds great and sometimes it just needs extra you know uh let's see can we go from 14.
nice. Nice. Yeah. So we'll check that later. I think we should all check those kind of chords and for the pitch especially. But I think that was much more expressive. And then da da m b. So this uh, this note here, what is it? A C sharp at sixteen um, from the bassoon. Maybe wait to play it just a little bit. Da da b. And hold it a little bit longer than you did, because it's very weird. It's very peculiar that everyone else stops and you're still holding this note here. But it's very interesting. Sometimes the weirder moments need time to settle in with the listener. They need space for us to hear. Oh, that was really strange. What a peculiar section that was. Like that was so interesting. I wonder what was happening in the scene there in the picture. You know, you can kind of think of. You know, like uh, the Rite of Spring or or Petrushka or um, any kind of uh, more uh, a, a piece with some sort of narrative. So, what's happening in this? Are we creating some sort of interesting narrative that the listener can follow? Kind of story that we can we can follow. So, give us time to hear that in order to make make sense of it all. Uh, good. One more time from uh, fifteen would be great. And I think there can be, it says senza diminuendo in the bassoon, senza diminuendo. So it really wants you to come out more. It's like your, your big solo, your big moment to shine. Yeah, this was, you know, this this sets up this section much better, I think. It gave us time to transition from that really, really intense section to this kind of super cantando, cantabile section with the oboe in a really beautiful, beautiful way. Bravo, that was really great. And, and it sets up these three chords on this kind of playing right at 16 and that space for that bottom note on the bassoon sets up the next three bar bars really well. Um, have you all decided to do, um, to make spaces between these three um, intentionally, or was that, is that kind of an accident? accident? Yeah, so let's, I think one way to do it is Yeah, if you think almost like an eighth note, eighth rest only, that might give it a nice feel, um, you know, but not to be, I, I think for balance sake, it's interesting, he writes mezzo forte in the bassoon and piano from everyone else. So, and I think this is a really nice, um, a nice balance here. So um, feel free to fill up the sound um, in the bassoon as well here, just to kind of everyone not to be too shy, just because, um, you know, sometimes when you write piano and everyone is kind of shy, like the sounds don't come out as, as fully and as beautifully as they can. So sit in it. Um, 
And then when the oboe comes in with this beautiful melody, sing it out much more. Just really tell the story. Continue telling the beautiful story of the whatever is going on in this in this beautiful um, narration. Um, so can we just start in measure the third measure of sixteen, please? Yeah, this is nice. Yeah, this is really great. Really interesting, really beautiful. I want all, I'd love all of those notes to speak. <laughs> so what I do sometimes, I'll tell you, I sometimes cheat. I, I sometimes write mezzo piano when I see a piano in like a low register or high register, whatever register and whatever, whatever instrument you're playing. Sometimes if it helps, I will write a mezzo piano, so I use enough air that the instrument speaks. Part of the thing that happens in, in our performances and in auditions or whatever, what have you, especially with our reed instruments, is that um, our notes just don't don't come out. You know, they might we might they not might not crack, they might not squeak on the clarinet, but sometimes they really most of the time what happens is that our articulations just don't come out. So you imagined like if you're playing a piano recital and like, you know, you push the key down and the note doesn't speak. If that happens enough, it gets kind of weird. You know, you can't really hear how the piano plays or how the pianist plays. So what I like to do is I like to make sure that all, if possible, of course, it's not easy. It's not as easy as I'm talking about it right now. But I love it if we use enough air or do whatever I have to do dynamically to make sure the notes, all the notes speak. So even if it's marked pianissimo, I'll try to play it softly, yes, but I'll also, I might write a mezzo piano just for my mind. So I use enough air that the instrument works and speaks. So we have bum, 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 bum. This is mysterious, but if it doesn't speak, it's less mysterious <laughs> than if we, if we hear the notes come out. So as, as, as softly and delicately as you're trying to play it, I would rather you play like mezzo piano, maybe even mezzo forte, if I can hear those notes underneath the oboe line, bum, 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 from the clarinet, from the bassoon and the clarinet, bum, 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 okay, great, let's go, I just want to hear that again, uh, before 17, one, two, three, four, molto lento, Yeah, great. 
This is lovely. Sempre e ben tenuto. Sempre fortissimo e ben tenuto. I don't think that ben tenuto is coming out. It needs to be much more sustained in this section, I think. Even with the articulation that we're doing, um, especially from um, everybody that's not the trumpet, trumpet. I think it needs to be have a little bit more sound res, um, sonority to it. So it becomes one of those peak orchestral moments like we had earlier, okay? Uh, can we try it just there at uh, 21? I, it, it still needs more espressivo on it um, from the three of you, um, everyone except the trumpet, underneath the trumpet. It sounds, of course, it's like a solo for the trumpet here, but it needs dum, dum, tim, pam, bim, Like you're really giving it your all, really fortissimo here. Once again. Yeah, yes, yeah, that's awesome. And then that's the only way this next part sounds like so dolce, you know, it almost goes into like a kind of Shostakovich-esque moment here, where it's like super intense and then it's like kind of cold and at a distance dynamically. So we need to hear that, that really sets up the piano much more um, uh, effectively. Okay, just one bar before 22. Nice. I think that was really, a lot of that was really, really convincing and really exciting. Um, so, uh, bravo. This really sounds, sounds really great. I think it's, 
the same same things that we've talked about already would really help this section when you play in piano so back at like 29 keeping the the staccato uh, and the accents and more sostenuto when you're you are sustained at a dynamic uh let's see going back just a little bit yeah this was great before the vivo uh at 23 this was all really excellent and i loved i loved uh what what the bassoon is doing i would just say two bars before the vivo uh one bar before the rallentando beep bum bum ba this triplet uh, forte i think you can be a little bit more on that um that entrance in the forte in the bassoon um right there at uh oh this is after 23 actually one two three fourth bar of 23. Uh, so can we go back to 23 and then get into the vivo and i just want to kind of restart and talk a little bit about the vivo just ensemble a couple ensemble things so let's start at uh, 23. Great. Yes. Um, so there's something actually also to mention about kind of how notes come out. So, you know, with reed instruments, we kind of know, we don't think of ourselves like this, but, you know, the, like in that last measure in the bassoon, you know what I like to talk about sometimes with my students and like with myself, the way I think about playing? And it's, it's interesting, this, it's, this uh, instrument combination for this group is so interesting. It might be. Uh, a little bit um, interesting to discuss for two seconds is that sometimes I think as just like um, with trumpet players, brass players, horn players, all this stuff, that we sometimes miss the notes in our mouths, if that makes sense. Even if we play a reed instrument, everyone thinks, oh, it's so easy to get all these notes out on the clarinet or whatever. But you can actually play the wrong note and have the wrong fingers down on the clarinet, just on the bassoon and the oboe, just like on a brass instrument, that if you don't have the right note in your ear, it's hard to play the right note because there's so many overtones and you can, you can kind of squawk and squeak. And, and if you're putting the right fingers down and that note doesn't come out, it's usually because we don't have it in our ear. You know, I've never played a brass instrument, so I don't know what that's like, but but I do know that, that it helps to be able to like play the, if I, if I imagine it, right? Playing the right note here and here and here really helps. So but, um, if I'm voicing something and I'm singing it and I'm just, it's like literally my mouth is not in the right place. That's the only way I can kind of describe it is that that happens a lot, even on our reeded instruments. Um, so it's something to think about if you're having kind of some a couple technical difficulties on the clarinet or oboe or any instrument with, um, you know, you have the right notes down, that reed isn't behaving. Well, sometimes it's just that we're not playing the right note up here in our ears. And so it's hard to produce that on the instrument, even though we, everything else being the same, it's like totally fine. Just a thought. Um, so can we go from the vivo? I think we need more staccato from everyone in the in the vivo vivo, especially notes like and at twenty four for instance. These need to be much shorter if possible. Okay.
Ah, uh, yes. This part, this part, I think it runs away a little bit. Just write a 27. Could we try that? Yeah, it's it's not it's almost there. It's not quite right. I think the duples can wait just a little bit more if I'm hearing right over these little headphones here. Perfect timing. Look at that. Five o'clock. <laughs> yeah, this is a uh, really great playing, everyone. Uh, really interesting, interesting piece. I'm really glad uh, you introduced it to me. And um, yeah, it was a, a real pleasure. Anybody have any questions or comments? Yeah, it depends on uh, how how quickly you have to do it. <laughs> um, just, uh, you know, nothing really. I think actually one interesting thing is that I think you should practice your scales on both instruments, just um, as an aside. Uh, it really helps to kind of get the fingers going in different directions and, and, and feeling how the resistances are different on the different instruments. And yeah, that's, that's basically it. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I sometimes prefer to play a piece that doesn't have it in there, even to this day, that doesn't have, you know, switching because it's kind of annoying, as you know. So like getting used to practicing on both instruments really helps. So it's like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter uh, which one. But uh, if, you, if you have to do it really quickly, you know, just, uh, <laughs> just practice that, you know, that switch. And sometimes you have to use the same barrel in order to do that easily. So just FYI, okay. Yeah, great. Well, it sounds great, everyone. It's really wonderful. Yeah, beautiful playing, beautiful playing. I wish I could have heard it in person. <laughs> great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much.